Well, good morning. Good morning to uh, you in the venue and you that are joining us online as well. Well, last week we finished our series that we called Together United in the Gospel. And, and I guess to anyone who wasn't here, it might sound selfish, but we've been totally focused the last four weeks on us, on the body of Christ. We've been reminded of the importance of our unity as a body, the importance of working together, the importance of protecting that unity. And, and I want to say, I've said it before, I want to say again, while our body is certainly uh, not perfect and we may have some, sometimes some brief uh, challenges to our unity, I'm grateful to be a pastor of a church that has a long track record of loving unity. Uh, that is a hallmark uh, of Geyer Springs. We, we don't disagree of course, on essential issues. There's no disagreement we have on the essential issues of our faith. And I would say we, we rarely disagree on any non-essential issues. And so we have built a very solid, resilient unity around the gospel, uh, around the word of God, around our faith, and our desire as the body of Christ to, to honor and to please the Father. We're, we're known, one of our hallmarks is that we simply want to obey uh, what the Father has said to us. And that's important because our unity is uh, foundational to our ability to advance the work of the kingdom, of the gospel, to accomplish what God has for us specifically as, as the body of Christ we call Geyer Springs First Baptist Church. You remember three weeks ago, we look at the, looked at the rebuilding of the wall and how the people under Nehemiah work together and, and what can be achieved under the banner of together. And, and last week, we looked very specifically at the fact that e each individual in the body has a calling and our unity is enhanced and our unity is strengthened by our mutual service. Every member of the body is gifted. Every member of the body has gifts given by the Spirit of God and you're gifted for service. And if you're a member of the body, you are vital and every member of the body is necessary. Why are we gifted? We're gifted for the benefit of others. We're gifted for the benefit of the body that it might grow and be all that the Lord has called us to be. And so if we don't all, every one of us individually, if we aren't investing ourselves according to the gifts that God has given, then the body will not be healthy. The body will not function to full capacity and the body will not thrive. Well, why do we need a healthy body? It's not just for us, but it's because there is a work to do. God has given us a very specific work, a commission that's given to us both individually and corporately by Christ. Individually, we have the commission. Corporately, we have the commission. And, and our Lord gave it to us just before he ascended. Can I remind you this morning of our mission statement here at Geyer Springs? Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. And you know that is taken from both the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Let me ask you if you can say it with me. Don't put it back up on the screen. Let's say it together. Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. It's in the Great Commission given by Jesus in Matthew 28. Before he ascended, he told the disciples, go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And then over in Matthew 22nd, Matthew the 22nd chapter, Jesus answered the question that was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He answered with these words in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So our service to the Lord extends beyond these walls and extends beyond us as the body of Christ. Our service to the Lord extends to our neighbors. Now, we have before approached our responsibility to our neighbors from a biblical perspective. In fact, just last spring, uh, we spent some time talking about our neighbors, who is a neighbor, and, and how do we care for them. But I, I think as we are drawing uh, to the end of the summer, uh, when kids are going to be going back to school in the next week or two, as we hopefully draw near the end of a very hot season and hope that that heat will abate, we're going to see our neighbors out more, we're going to see people at home more. And I want to remind and challenge us of the opportunity we have to love and to bless our neighbors. Now, we're not going to repeat uh, what we covered last year. We're going to take a little bit different approach, but I want to give some very practical advice and simple steps over the next four weeks that will be very easy um, for you to put into practice. Now, 
The information I'm going to share is not new to me. There are two pastors, uh, Dave and John Ferguson. They actually co-pastor a church together. I I can't imagine co-pastoring with a sibling. That's beyond what I can comprehend. Clearly, God is in that. But Dave and John Ferguson were both very frustrated with their own attempts to share their faith. They're telling their people to share their faith, but they themselves are frustrated with their attempts. And that might surprise you to hear that, but I'm gonna tell you that pastors have some of the same frustrations you do with with sharing your faith. Uh, If you're trying to use something you've memorized, a, a plan or a canned approach, it feels awkward. If you're trying to find a way to to jump into a gospel conversation, a lot of times that's a very difficult thing to do. And sometimes we get very frustrated trying to share verbally, so we think, well, I'm just going to live a good life in front of people. But you realize pretty quickly that just living a good life in front of people doesn't articulate the gospel. That doesn't accomplish our purpose. So, So the question this morning is, how are we supposed to connect with and how are we supposed to effectively communicate the gospel message to the people that God has placed around us? Well, when you look into the scripture and specifically you look into the gospels, you see some pretty clear patterns on how Jesus related to people. Jesus always took the time to get involved in a person's life. He got to know them. He he spent time with them. He addressed them at their point of need. He figured out where they had interests. He figured out where their point of need was, and that's where he met them. And Jesus never left a person as they were. He would minister to their needs, maybe specifically their physical needs, and then use that as a springboard to speak to their eternal need. So Dave and John, these two pastors, took what they observed in Jesus' life and practices, and and they took all that information and they reduced it to five simple steps. And those five simple steps they used, uh, they, they put an acronym together, and the acronym is simply the word bless. And so we're going to take the next four weeks. Yes, there are five steps, but you know me, I rush through everything. We're going to take four weeks to cover these five steps and talk about how we can be a blessing and how we can bless our neighbors. You know, we say it a lot around here. um, We are blessed to be a blessing. And that's an important thing for us to keep in mind as Christ's followers. The blessings we have, God has given us in order that we might be a blessing to others. You certainly see that Uh, financially and materially. Many of us have much more than we need. We recognize that what we have not only comes from God, but belongs to God. And so we don't struggle at all. We're pretty faithful to help and to bless others, especially those in need. It, It never fails something like we just did in packing food to go to Ukraine, it never fails when we come to the church and say, hey, here's this need um, to help others. It never fails that you faithfully give to help that need. Well, think about the fact that much more valuable than our material blessings are our spiritual blessings, and specifically our our salvation that God has given to us. God has called each of us to himself, and he's provided our salvation. Well, that blessing also is intended to be shared with others who haven't yet received it. And this is a pattern we see in Scripture. Turn this morning, just for a few moments, to Genesis chapter 12. We see this pattern specifically in the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. And let me tell you what's happening here in Genesis 12. Abraham, Abram at this point, is living in a pagan culture. They worship many gods. And Abram, just like those around him, is worshiping idols. He wasn't seeking God. He wasn't pursuing God. He wasn't seeking after God. But God in his, in his wisdom and God in his sovereignty called Abram to himself. Abram wasn't deserving in some way, and neither are you and I. Just think about that for just a moment. Isn't it amazing that God had mercy on us, and God showed us grace, and God chose us to be his people? Never, never forget that. You and I weren't deserving We weren't seeking after God, but God came and sought us and showed mercy and grace and saved us. And that's what's happening here in Genesis 12 in the life of Abram. Look at verses 1 through 3 with me. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
Isn't it interesting? The first thing God says to Abram is to go. That, that kind of sounds, sounds familiar. In the, in the Great Commission, we're told to go. If we're going to be a blessing, we, we've got to go. And God told Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and you and your people, your descendants, will be a blessing. In fact, in those three short verses, you see the word bless, blessed, or blessing five times. God says, Abraham, Abram, your people are going to bring the blessing of God to all the world. Now, turn over to Genesis, over in your New Testament, to Genesis chapter 3. If you remember from our study of Galatians back in the spring, some false teachers have crept into the church. They're trying to convince these Gentile believers that, yes, faith is good, but you have to have faith and you have to keep the ceremonial law that the Jews kept. So Paul is reminding them that our justification is by faith alone, and Abraham is the example of that truth. He was justified by God before there was a law. Abraham had not been given a law to keep, and God justified him before there was a law. He was justified and accepted solely by his faith in the living God. Look in Galatians chapter 3 and verses 7 through 9. Paul writes, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And from the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. What's Paul saying? He's saying, if you have come to God by faith in Jesus, you're a child of Abraham. And remember, we saw in Genesis that Abraham and his offspring are going to bless all nations. And so Paul says here in Galatians that we are blessed along with Abraham. Why? Because of the mercy and grace of God. And so we are now children of Abraham. As children of Abraham, as we've been blessed, we're also called to be a blessing to all people. And it's really a very simple strategy. God's plan is to love and to bless our neighbors through us. And it doesn't matter what you think about your neighbor. It doesn't matter if, you, if your neighbor's like Abraham, just living like a pagan. That doesn't matter. It's God's calling on a person's life. It's not that they are seeking him, but that he seeks them and he calls them. And so we want to go with God's plan and bless our neighbors. And the practices we're going to talk about over the next four weeks are not difficult at all. They're not complicated. They're not burdensome. You're not going to walk out of here feeling pressured. Hey, I've got to, to do something. I know that loving some neighbors is not easy. Believe me, I've got neighbors on both sides of me that are difficult to love sometimes. And Tyler Nelson in the venue. But I can promise you that blessing your neighbors is not going to be complicated. In fact, in, in most cases, the things you're going to be doing are going to be fun and definitely going to be rewarding. Well, a good teacher uh, always has some goals written down at the beginning of the lesson. So let me just go ahead and tell you right now the, the goals that I have for us over the next four weeks. Number one, very simply, is I want us to learn to love our neighbors the same way Jesus did. That's the pattern we're going to be looking at. And I want us to love our neighbors the way that he did. Secondly, I want to spare all of us from, from awkward encounters and difficult conversations that strain a relationship. You know, sometimes we get in a relationship with someone and we try to share the gospel and it's awkward and then it's awkward from there forward in that relationship. I want us to be able to avoid that. I want to simplify the process of sharing the gospel to the point it just flows very naturally over the course of the relationship. It flows very naturally and easily from your heart. And then fourthly, I want us to learn to bless people around us within the normal course and flow of our lives. It's not something we have to conjure up. It's not something we have to make happen. It just occurs in the normal course of our lives that we're able to bless uh, our neighbors. Well, before we look at the B in the word bless, I feel like I need to clarify our responsibility. You see, we have a responsibility in people coming to Christ, but we also need to remember um, that God has a responsibility. We're joining him in his work. It's God's work to bring a person to saving faith. He's the one that converts people. Sometimes we, we get into this and we get all frustrated and we feel pressured because we think we have the responsibility for them to be saved. No, it's God who works in them. He enables them. He draws them to saving faith. You do not have the responsibility to save someone. That's not your job. 
That's God's job. You cannot. You and I can't save anyone. It's the work of God alone. I want you to say this. I want you to say out loud, I cannot save anyone. Ready? I cannot save anyone. Pressure's off. It's not your responsibility. It's God's responsibility. The outcome is God's responsibility. We're just responsible to be a witness. We're just responsible to be faithful, to speak forth, and to live out the truth of the gospel. How someone responds to that is not up to us. We can't save anyone, but what we can do is love our neighbor. Now, who's the neighbor? Could be the person who literally lives next door to you. Could be a coworker wherever you work. Could be a student in the classroom. Could be a person on your on your uh, on your sports team. Your neighbor is someone you have contact with in the normal course of your life, and you'll have to figure out. God will lay on your heart the neighbor or maybe neighbors that He wants you to bless. But your neighbor is anyone that you have contact with in the normal course of your life. You love your neighbor. And yes, you're to be a witness, you're to look for an opportunity to speak about the Lord and what he has done for you and what he can mean in their lives, but that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is to love and to bless our neighbor. You know, it seems like sometimes when we talk about evangelism, our sole focus, and this is what we get hung up on, our sole focus when we talk about evangelism is the message, the message, the message, and we get uptight about that. Is the message important? Absolutely the message is important. You can't come to Christ without hearing the truth of the gospel. The problem is we force the message and we haven't prepared the heart to receive the message. If we don't prepare the heart to receive the message, it's unlikely that the message is going to take root. Is the goal to see your family and friends come to saving faith? Absolutely. No no question about it. But the goal cannot be what drives us. Our relationships with our neighbors have to be driven by love. If our relationship with our neighbors is not driven by love, pretty quickly they're going to feel like that, that they're just a task. They're just something we're checking off of our religious or checking off of our church list. And, and there's a, sure, there's a balance there. Yes, we want to see our neighbors come to Christ, but our focus is on blessing our neighbor and loving our neighbor. That's the focus. That's the priority. Of course, the other side of that is if we truly love them, as we develop a relationship with them, as we bless them, as we get involved in their lives, then it's going to become very natural to talk about Jesus and what he means to us. But the conversations will be natural and be a whole lot easier. 2008, there was a doctoral student by the name of Mark Russell. Mark wrote a dissertation based on mission work in Thailand, and the research had been done across different groups of missionaries working there, some research on those mission endeavors. And the dissertation is quite lengthy. It was more than 250 pages. I will admit I did not read it. Who would want to read a dissertation unless you had insomnia anyway? But there were a lot of good insights um, in this dissertation, and one that really stood out to me was a a contrast between two different models of ministry in Thailand. One model was called the BLESS model, the other was called the CONVERT model. And very simply stated, two different teams of missionaries uh, went to Thailand. They had the same goal. Obviously, the goal was to see people come to Christ. That's why they had, had moved to Thailand and moved their families to Thailand. But they had very different strategies. One group stated that their sole intention was evangelizing and converting people. Their goal was simply to save souls. In in the dissertation, that group was referred to as the converters. The second group was called the blessers, and they explained that their intention was to bless whomever God sends our way. So the two groups of missionaries were followed for two years. At the end of the two years, they discovered two important keys about these groups of missionaries. The first key was in all the communities where the blessers had planted themselves, where they were located, the the presence of the blessers resulted in a lot of social good in those communities. The communities became a better place to live. Society in that area was improved. Now, Now understand, don't hear me say, the blessers were just there to do social good. The blessers were there to make the earthly life of the Thai people better. Part of that, and it was stated in their mission, was to help people grow in their understanding of the Christian message and become Christ's followers. I mean, how can you consider yourself a blesser if you're not gonna share the greatest blessing you've ever been given? But their focus was not 
getting the message of the gospel out there until first they had blessed the people in their community. So they were more focused on not just seeing someone converted, but loving and blessing people. Did it work? Did loving and blessing lead to conversion? Well, here's the second key to this study. The blessers had a 48 times higher conversion rate than the converters. They saw 48 times as many people come to Christ through their ministry of blessing than the converters saw through simply getting the gospel out there. So what, what does that tell us? Well, loving our neighbors and blessing our neighbors works. Yes, we're going to share the gospel message, but first, we're going to prepare the soil. We're going to prepare the heart. You know, if we, if we truly love our neighbors, it's a lot easier to convince them of God's love for them. We're a demonstration of his love for them. So how do you bless your neighbor? Letter B. Y'all, y'all want to know how to spell bless? B-L-E-S-S. It's out there on the front wall. Okay. The letter B very simply is to begin with prayer. Now, you expected that, right? You knew that prayer would have some part in this, in this uh, plan to bless our neighbors. You expected that, and that's because we can do nothing apart from prayer. It's absolutely impossible for us to do what God has called us to do without praying. We, we already said salvation is the work of God. He's the one who moves in a person's heart and life. He's the one who draws a person to saving faith. So he's the one we need to talk to about our burden for our neighbors. And, you know, when we pray, especially regarding opportunities of ministry, when we pray, what we're doing is modeling what Jesus did. Look over in Luke 4. And I'm not, I'm not going to read the passage to you, but I want you to glance at it. In Luke 4, you see the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In Luke 4, Luke tells us that after Jesus was baptized, when he comes up out of the water of the Jordan where John had baptized him, Luke 4 tells us, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Well, what did he do when he was in the wilderness? Yes, he was tempted by Satan. There was that moment. But what did he do when he was in the wilderness? What happened during those 40 days? For 40 days, while he was in the wilderness, Jesus fasted and prayed. So he began from the point of baptism. That was the start of his earthly ministry. He began his earthly ministry. Before he did anything, he began in prayer. Turn over a couple of pages in your Bible to Luke 6. Jesus is about to select those who are going to join him on the mission. And in Luke 6 and verse 12 and 13, it says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, who he named apostles. And you see this, it's not just the beginning of Jesus' ministry, all through his ministry, you see this, that Jesus would always take the time to stop and pray. He didn't rush ahead into the work, but he would take the time first to stop and to pray. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you some very specific scriptures and prayer points. I believe it's important when we're praying to make sure our prayers are lined up with what's in the Word of God. And I'm going to give you specific scriptures and points on how to pray as you pray for God to work in your neighbor. But I, but I need to warn you, for God to work in your neighbor, as you pray for God to work in your neighbor, you need to recognize that before God works in your neighbor, he's going to work in you. Prayer is not just about trying to change God's mind or get God to do something. Prayer is about aligning ourselves with God's will and his plans and his purposes. And that means that a part of our time in prayer is going to be God working in us to get us aligned with him. For prayer to change our neighbors, it first must change us. And that's what you have to understand as we pray. Corey Tin Boom, many of you have heard of, was a Holocaust survivor, and he saw God's miraculous hand in her life and in the lives of others in, in many different ways. Listen to what she said about prayer. We never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect he will get us involved in his plan for the answer. 
You know, when you feel a stirring in your heart for someone, when you feel a stirring in your heart for, for a neighbor to love your neighbor and to bless your neighbor, and when you begin by praying for your neighbor, you, you recognize that stirring has come from the Lord. He's the one who's placed the desire on your heart. He's the one who's calling you to pray for your neighbor. And as you pray for your neighbor, he's going to show you his plan for blessing your neighbor and giving your neighbor opportunity to hear the gospel. And he's going to show you his plan to do that through you, through you. Now, I said we'd be practical as we walk through this. As you leave this morning, you're gonna receive a card. As you exit the doors this morning, you're gonna receive a card that will tell you very specifically what to pray and how to pray. And as I said, these are all scriptural prayers. And there are two sides to the card. One side says, my prayer for me. The other side says, my prayer for blank, where you just write in the name of the neighbor that God has placed on your heart. But for every um, bulleted, for every item on here, every item listed to pray, there's a scripture. For example, in, in praying for yourself, you're going to pray to be obedient to God's call. You're going to pray that God would give you a burden for that neighbor. And, and the scripture there under burden for the neighbor is Matthew 22, 39, where it says Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers into his harvest field. When he told the disciples that to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers, he wasn't telling them they didn't have to go. They were the front line. They were to go. And I would suggest to you as you pray scripture, you put your name in there wherever you can. You pray, Lord, help me like Jesus when I see the crowds. Help me to have compassion on them. Help me to see my neighbor as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. God, give me the compassion to go and the courage to go. You're going to pray that God would enable you to build a relationship. You're going to pray that God would give you boldness, that God would give you the words to say. You're going to pray in, in Matthew 10 where Jesus told the disciples, don't be anxious about what you're going to say. At the time, when the time is right, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. You're going to pray that for yourself. God, when the time is right, when I've built this relationship and, and the gospel conversation comes naturally, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it right. So, God, I'm going to trust your Holy Spirit who lives in me to give me the words to say. So you're going to pray very scripturally as you pray for yourself. And then as you pray for your neighbor. You're going to pray that they'd be open to a relationship, that, that Satan would not blind them from the truth, that any barriers to the gospel would be removed. You're going to pray scripture because you're recognizing it is spiritual warfare when you're trying to get the gospel across to your neighbor. Satan will do everything he can to blind them from the truth. Satan will throw up all kinds of walls and all kinds of barriers and give them all kinds of reasons that will share with you that they just can't accept the gospel. So you're going to pray those things down with scripture. You're going to pray that they come to the point that they seek to know God, that, that the Spirit of God, as he has said he would do in John 16, would convict them of sin and, and righteousness and judgment. You're going to pray that God will send someone knowing the person he's probably going to send is you. And then you're going to pray that they would believe the gospel and confess Jesus as Lord. You ready for an adventure? I'm going to tell you. Crazy things happen when you really pray. Back in the spring, our staff team was reading through and, and talking about and having a lot of conversations and praying about unsaved church members. We were praying, and, and we didn't know them by name. We, God didn't reveal who they were, but we were praying about people in our midst who needed a relationship with Jesus. You know what's happened? You've seen it. For several weeks now, since the spring, we've seen people that we all know and love come to love and trust Jesus. And as they have come and professed their faith and have shared their stories, it's helped others. Right. One of the most common phrases around here during our services now is, that's me. They see and they hear the story and they say, that's me. I don't have a relationship with Christ. I need to come to know Christ. We've got four folks coming for baptism this morning, three of them adults who all at one point in time in their life said, that's me. The first one this morning is Melissa Hudson. We did not have opportunity to get her testimony recorded, but she sent it to me this week. And so as John and Melissa prepare for baptism, I'm going to read Melissa's testimony to you. When I was five years old, I had an experience that I considered salvation. 
I walked the aisle and prayed with my pastor. I was baptized and life was good. I had done what my friends had done. They were a little older than me, but I was too young to understand the commitment I was supposed to make to the Lord. When I was in kindergarten, my dad surrendered to the ministry, and I'm so thankful her dad and mom are able to be here today. Her dad is still pastoring. I grew up in church, so not attending wasn't an option. If you were, weren't sick, you went. I didn't have a problem with that. I enjoyed church. Fast forward through my teenage years to my young adult years, I felt conviction that I was not a Christian. This is a battle that has been waged throughout my adult life. I would feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, but the devil would always say, you're fine, you've been saved. Along with the spiritual war that has raged inside through the last few years, I've also been in a state of turmoil because of life. With the stress of work, family, finances, you name it, there was no peace in sight. Around Easter, the Lord began moving in a mighty way at Geyer Springs. I've seen children, teenagers, and young adults say, but this time I was seeing people who struggled the same way that I have. God began convicting me again that even though I had prayed the prayer and been baptized before, I had missed a significant part of salvation, submission to him, the Almighty. He alone holds the power to bring peace to my life that has been full of turmoil and doubt. Saying a prayer does not save. Being baptized does not save. Jesus saves. I have now done more than just ask forgiveness for all of my sins, but my prayer this time had substance and submission. I still have stress in my life, but I'm attempting to daily leave that at the feet of Jesus. I have finally found peace in the midst of the stress and strife that we all live in. Melissa, thank you for sharing your story and for being obedient. I know Melissa has family here and friends. If you are a family or friend of hers or have been with her on this journey, would you stand in her honor this morning as we baptize her? Melissa, is it your testimony that you've made Christ Lord and Savior of your life. Yeah, well, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Amen. Way to go. And let's, uh, let's listen now to the story of Philip and Savannah Rye. I'm Philip Rye. And I'm Savannah Rye. And this is our story. Like a lot of people here in the church, I grew up in church, um, was there every time the doors were open. My dad was a minister of music. My mom played the organ. We, uh, my sister and I sang in the choir, you know, just been very, very involved. Over the past several months, God and the Holy Spirit just really started to stir in my heart. And all that started back in early April. Uh, we just happened to be up in Fayetteville one weekend when uh, Luke Welch, a former college student that was here, uh, he was baptized and he just said, you know, how can I lead young men and how can I lead these guys at the church? How can I do that when my heart's not right? You know, and that's the very first time the Holy Spirit just started pulling and I thought, you know, that's me. So then over the next few weeks, uh, Dave, preached a message on the cultural Christian and just doing what you're supposed to do and just going through the motions, you know, and so just a little bit more, the Holy Spirit started working on me and stirring in me. As Paul was baptized and then the following weeks, a couple of other people, uh, Hayden was baptized and then Katie was baptized. Every time I see that, I would go, that's me. You know, th that's me right there. I just didn't have the boldness to come forward. So on Sunday, July the 10th, I'm sitting there and Dave is preaching. And when Katie was baptized, uh, the Sp Holy Spirit. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit really started working on me. And it was all I could do to sit there. So right after church, I found Jason, I made a beeline for him. And I just said, hey, we need to go talk. I just told him my story. I said, hey, I prayed the prayer when I was 10 years old. Um, I was baptized. I realized my need for Christ at that time, but I never made a commitment. I never, it, it was just going through the motions of doing what we did, a cultural Christian, you know? And there was never a change. There was never a commitment in my heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit had been working on. And Jason said, well, Philip, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to get it right, right now, you know. And so he asked me some more questions and we talked and um, he said, so what is, and, and I feel this is very important as people, especially for people 
my age. He said, what's kept you from doing this, you know? And it's all pride and fear. And it's always, what will other people think? You know, what's my wife gonna think? Or what are my friends gonna think? Or yeah, it's embarrassment or, you know, I'm supposed to have all this together. I've played in the orchestra here for 18 years. So I've sat right down there in that seat for 18 years with an empty heart. And Jason said, you can be faithful without faith. And that is just wrong in my ears that for so many years, I was faithful without faith. And I was doing all the right things and I let pride and I let fear get in the way. So I sat there on that day and I asked Jesus into my heart and I asked him to forgive me of my sins. Um, and just, Katie alluded to this in her baptism, just this peace, just this burden and this anxiety was just lifted. So when Savannah got home, you know, I just couldn't wait to tell her. And so she comes in the kitchen and she's tired. And I said, hey, I have some exciting news today. I asked Jesus into my heart and I'm expecting this. Yay, you know, and hug. And it was really, it, she just said, oh, <laughs> she's like, oh, great. And just like that, the Holy Spirit opened the door. And I had been struggling for months over just with doubt and, um, just the desire to draw near to God and just repetitive sin and I knew that I needed to fix that. And because of my dad's obedience and what I saw from God's faithfulness, I was able to talk out my struggles with uh, Tara Ledford and I was saved four days later. Um, and it's just amazing, you know, how you can, I can rest in the peace and the joy that has fulfilled me and I just can't wait to see what God has for the both of us in the future. So if you're sitting out there today and you've got that tightness and that anxiety in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. I've always heard the term, the Holy Spirit tugging at your heartstrings, you know, and I didn't really get that, but it was anxiety. I mean, it was, it was unhappiness um, and uneasiness. Get that right today because the Holy Spirit, He's not gonna leave you alone. <laughs> you know, I just, I think we both just kept thinking, hey, this is gonna go away, or, you know, it's, something's making me anxious. Well, it's the Holy Spirit stirring in your heart. That awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Philip, thank you for your obedience and listening to the Holy Spirit as he stirred your heart, knowing that there are others who go through that same thing. Uh, if you're in the venue or the worship center, and you're a family member or a friend of Philip's, would you stand in his honor as we celebrate this moment together? Philip, is it your testimony that you have asked Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life? 100%. Amen. Well, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Amen. Stay here. I do all the baptizing around here. I am Casey Winsett, if you are not familiar with me, and I am so excited to present Savannah Rye. What a beautiful picture. Uh, I love watching the Rye story unfold. Philip, thank you so much for your faithfulness as a father uh, to shepherd your family and didn't even realize what you were doing uh, in the work that God was stirring in Savannah's heart. And so uh, let that be just a reminder, parents, man, there are things that when the Holy Spirit is moving and working, it's not just in your life, but it's in the lives of others as we talk about neighboring. Man, it's in the lives of the people that we do life with, and I'm excited about that. And so Savannah, uh, man, she prayed a prayer at eight years old uh, with, with Paige, I guess it was Kate at the time. Uh, and she said, man, it's just kind of like my dad, like just I I've been living uh, unemotional um, and so she finally uh, had a chance to sit down with our girls associate, Tara Ledford, and she gave her life to the Lord. And I'm excited about that. If you uh, are a friend, family, supporter, uh, neighbor of Savannah Rye, if you could stand up just to show her uh, and show the picture of the church. And this is beautiful people's lives that uh, they are investing in the lives of students. Uh, and it is generationally. And so we're thankful for that. And so Savannah, have you indeed invited Jesus into your heart? And you want to follow him in all that you do. Yes. And it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
Oh, what a special time to be a part of what God is doing here at Geyer Springs, isn't it? And I have Ella Grant here with me. And let me just share a little bit about how Ella came to faith. Growing up in a believing home a couple of years ago, and under the nurture and care of her parents, they watched the production of The Kingdom online that many of you were a part of. After watching that, God stirred her heart, opened her heart, and she put her trust and faith in Jesus Christ. What a blessing that ministry has been, not only to our church, but also to the community. And so Ella is coming today to let you know that she has turned from her sin and put her trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And so if you're a friend, a family member, you have taught Ella in Sunday school or midweek or any other ministry of this church, would you stand now in support of the Lord's work in her life and her heart? You know, the Bible is clear in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm an everyone Ella is in everyone. Some of you have been in everyone, and some of you can be in everyone if the Lord is stirring in your heart today. So Ella, you're going to have a chance to proclaim the gospel to so many here this morning, and I'm going to ask you, just as the others have been asked, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Upon hearing that profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. you bow with me this morning here and in the venue as well would you just bow for just a moment it's always important for us to take some time to think about what God has said he speaks to each of us individually the Holy Spirit who indwells us speaks to us and meets us at our point of need and so I want to take just a moment this morning and think about how we respond to the Word of God how we respond to the testimonies we've seen first thing very obviously is if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ you need to get that settled we have pastors available. I'll be down at the front at the end of the service, so we'll be pastors in the lobby with a tag on so you can find them. If you're in the venue, you just head to the back of the room by the big Next Steps banner. But we would like to just talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. We're, we're not going to push you into a decision. We just want to share with you. It's a decision you have to make on your own. Maybe here this morning, and that has happened in your life in the past, but you've not followed Christ in baptism. That's a very important step of obedience. We want to help you with that as well. So I hope you'll take time before you leave this campus today to seek out one of our pastors and let us help you with that. Well, for those of us who know Christ, those of us who've been uh, baptized, those of us who are walking with him, not perfectly, but walking with him daily, would you think for just a moment how awesome it would be to see a, a friend, a neighbor, a family member, a coworker, a classmate, a team at how awesome it would be to see one of them right up there in those waters declaring their faith in Christ. And what it would be like knowing that that happened because you made the decision to love your neighbor and to bless your neighbor. Our calling is clear from scripture. It's to get the message of the gospel out. And the best way for us to do that is to invest our lives in the lives of the people around us. People are so much more open to the message of the gospel, to believing and understanding God's great love for them when they have seen his love demonstrated through you and through me. It's not always easy. The practices are pretty simple, but it's not always easy. It's hard to love others. It's hard to love our own family sometimes. But as we bless our neighbors and as we love our neighbors, God is going to open some doors. And we're going to see him do some great things. What has the Spirit said to you this morning? And how do you need to respond?